They're, they're, I think they're talking about how we won some ping pong last night, Bob. Can, can we do one more of these? The big we. Bam. Just saying. Very stiff competition, too. Well, huh? we were, always, we were losing every game. Yeah, big comeback. Always come back. We're going to talk about some other areas of impact. Uh, just so uh, you know, introduce myself. My name is Mark White. I'm a co-founder and managing partner of Prairie Crest Capital. We focus on early stage science tech and deep tech. We grew out of an ag tech thesis into science tech and deep tech because those organizations, as Rich Gantz pointed out, some of the people on a previous panel on biotechnology, and we focus. We don't focus on human biotechnology, but other biotechnologies. You know, there's a very difficult path to uh, commercialization and uh, into um, ultimate liquidity events. We discovered we had a. We had a very good niche there and some skills there, so we decided to focus on that. Secondarily, part of my life is trying to find a solution. Uh, it, part, part of Prairie Crest Capital also is that social impact includes an emphasis on black and female founders. And uh, over half of our investments are in black founders, 70% in, uh, in black and female founders in the science and deep tech areas. But part of my, part of the other part of my activities is trying to find a you know be part of finding a solution or help find a solution or be part of just helping a few people who are are black founders who are, do not want to who aren't founding a scalable technology business or science business that has three billion dollars of total addressable market for which there's increasingly a, an increasing amount of capital available but what if people who want to want to open a mobile mobile meat shop. Uh, people who want to open a, butch uh, a butcher, people who want to open a commercial bakery. So that's another part of my activities, but uh, that's who I am. And I'm going to let Eddie introduce himself and Bob, and then we'll you know, start some questions once you know, I have a better idea what they want to talk about. Yes. And analogous to Marius holding up the timer, I'm asking Stephen Burke, whom I have the privilege of being on a flight later today, to hold me accountable. And, and move when we need to move. I'm sorry for that. Uh, my name is Eddie Vanderpart, and I'm a ping pong player, predominantly. <laughs> but in my spare time, I also uh, invest a little bit. Uh, we have a, a fund together with Rich Schobel, who's also a 361 member and stalwart uh, in uh, early stage uh, impact investments. And that spends ex exactly what we talked about uh, uh, in, in, in the last meeting, uh, healthcare. Um, that was a, which was a great panel, uh, ag tech, climate tech, uh, and education. Uh, and so we do early stage, late seed stage through series B investment there. Uh, and we really focus on disruptive technologies, so not marginal technologies, make a better mousetrap, but really disruptive technologies typically uh, that change uh, the way the world works. Uh, but we ultimately, and, and I think that was sort of the implicit conclusion of the last panel as well, we, we invest in people, because technology can only do so much. Uh, at the end of the day, you can course correct with very good people, but it's very difficult to course correct with technology if you don't have the right people. Um, and, and so we invest in great, a great team of people who, who, who understand their, their business, but are also flexible enough to know that the future in six months, two years, five years from now is ultimately very different than than what we have right now. And so that the flexibility, the malleability of people is something we, uh, we uh, heavily believe and invest in. Um, we've been on this path now for, um, for 12 months or so. We made eight investments. Um, and a lot of people ask uh, me particularly, how can you invest in so many different things and your brain is so small? Uh, and so I, I say, well, every vertical, we have people much smarter than us that have deep domain knowledge. And, just singling out to Julia here, who is an uh, incredible uh, human being, and we invest with her in, uh, in, in health tech. She has the health tech experience that comes along with our sort of standard commercial due diligence. Uh, that, 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 that really helps. Um, to your point earlier, um, yeah, we, we also really like to invest, for example, in women and minorities. And, and a simple reason why is, and I, I, I know the numbers for women, there's only 3% of the of the of the of the VC capital is by is uh, is is, ma is managed by women and and they outperform men by a very significant margin, so there's zero reason not to. 
just simply from my return perspective, uh, you know, the, the other perspectives are, uh, are, are, are fairly obvious. Um, so that's what we're trying to do. That's why we, why we are happy with folks like, uh, like Julia and Christina. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it for now. I'll Mike and Bob Bernstein, ping pong coach. <laughs> <laughs> I really missed it a bad laugh. So I've got a, a kind of a multitude of worlds. I, I am theoretically and technically retired from um, a fintech company called InvestNet here in Chicago, which uh, very much democratized and digitized the retail wealth management world, and uh, a great deal learned in the process. My very dear friend, the founder of that company, Judd Bergman, uh, built the company on the notion that democratizing the industry would uh, basically provide independence for, you know, the typical Merrill, Goldman, Morgan Stanley broker to, to do the right thing by their clients, be independent, et cetera. And the only reason I bring that up is because over the course of uh, the inception of that company, it literally grew to what is today five and a half trillion dollars of assets on the platform and uh, brought the cost of a retail portfolio down from probably well over 300 basis points with all the hidden fees to well under 100. Um, and <clears throat> lots of uh, disintermediation in the process. So um, that'll come into play here in a second. Uh, but uh, very successful firm. I had the great uh, humble opportunity to build the retirement equivalent of that platform. Uh, and that became over a trillion in and of itself um, at the time that I retired in the end of 99. So um, that allowed me to focus once again. I'd had a couple of other great exits from big institutional money management firms. And in 2002, built a family office. And in 2008, one of the real opportunities for me, as I mentioned yesterday, was co-founding Guitars Over Guns. Uh, with my oldest son, Chad, who's a tremendous uh, jazz trombonist uh, and a new Trier grad. So, you know, our family was all raised in Chicago. Um, and uh, so Guitars Over Guns is the not-for-profit not uh, side of the ed tech world. And essentially, we are uh, teaching middle school kids with the arts, uh, principally music and could be any of the physical arts as well, uh, but the, the key there really is a combination of music to break barriers and create engagement, a professional mentor, a professional musician acting as the teacher, if you will. And then the third part of that is getting them to perform where the fear of doing so and overcoming that is so powerful that once they've done that, and these are kids that have never seen an instrument or you know, are starting truly from scratch, and they're, and they're recording by the end of the year, and they have a proof statement of that, which basically is the confidence builder that they can do anything. And that is an unbelievable thing to witness and really powerful. Now, there's a lot of, um, uh, there's a lot of what COVID did that put an unbelievable, just think about this, you've got an organization that's multi-million, thousands of kids, and now you have no schools, to do your after school programming in, nor do you have any venues for your professional musicians to make a living outside of the small amount that we pay them. Um, and, and so you should be dead. <laughs> I mean, there should be no reason to exist. And within 40 days, we were able to get hotspots in every single school that we had across all of LA, Miami, and Chicago. And we were able to get smart devices into every kid's hands because the schools actually had those. Nobody just knew where they were, and we were just a squeaky wheel. So the, the, the importance of that is that, that only thanks to technology were we able to engage all these kids, and we were 90-plus percent effective 45 days later and tripled in size from pre-COVID to now. So... Um, and, and I had a great conversation with Howard Tolman yesterday about uh, collaborating on some really interesting activities because the number of desktops that are being uh, mothballed is unbelievable. And the number of libraries that are not used at all are equally unbelievable. Just think about all of those, lap all of those desktops just being nothing more than streaming devices inside libraries, which are safe spaces just like schools are, 
And you can just imagine the proliferation and opportunity set that could grow from that. So that's in the not-for-profit um, ed tech world. Uh, the other part of me is very committed to vocational ed tech. And one of the industries in which that's happening is the democratization of the moving industry. Anybody here moved and not used a uh, corporate reload to move? Any, any, anybody, anybody have a good experience doing that? All right, anybody want a gun <laughs> by the time that's over? So, so I'll just cut to the chase and just say um, the, the beauty of that industry is that it's so Neanderthal. I mean, it's a world of number two pencils and cigar chewing guys that just could care less about the customer experience. And if all you did is use your camera to digitally capture all the contents in the room and then all the artificial intelligence and machine learning to evolve a complete fingerprint of that chair to know that it's actually a baker with a skew of X, you will just completely transform the pricing to be 100% transparent. And then you will have an end-to-end -end platform that will capture all these physical assets which have enormous marketing value because you have a complete biographical understanding of somebody's aspirations. And so that leads to all kinds of digital marketing opportunities and upending the Facebook Amazon world which does that marketing with complete privacy invasion. So again, today's technology allows that to happen, protecting, creating almost a fiduciary overlay to consumerism. And the point of all that is that it's already an industry where almost half are black and brown owned businesses. And helping them compete by providing a complete tutorial on the platform puts them in a position not only to grow their businesses dramatically, but for us to go into the same communities in which our Guitars Over Guns kids are coming out to find vocational opportunities and new entrepreneurs in order to be able to provide them a very for-profit platform, which again is completely vocationally driven and brings the two worlds together. So that's our world. Both fascinating stories. So, so my observation, I'm gonna ask you a question about what's the most difficult for you to imagine solving, both of you, right? Given your, your focuses. Because my observation is uh, both in ag tech in focusing on nutritional equity is a very hard thing to solve. It's a very hard thing to solve and in, in, in imagine it scalable. In ed tech, in a lot of ways, if you're focused on an equity, del delivering, delivering equity in education, a lot of the new technologies that are out there uh, really serve wealthier children. And, and Bob, what you're doing in, in your nonprofit is the opposite of that. You know, I understand. So what, what do each of you see as difficult areas of that in impact in ed tech or um, ag tech or nutrition or or climate or other areas where it's very difficult to find a purely commercial solution and what's your imagination for kind of approaching those? Is that I, I don't mean, don't, don't mean to sabotage you with that question or anything, but <laughs> well, you might sabotage Eddie, but I'm good. <laughs> Uh, I, I'll, I'll be I'll be quick because uh, Stephen has five fingers up. Um, <laughs> in edtech, I, mean, I think we talked about it last time uh, uh, yesterday, and this is a unfortunately very difficult to solve. The main thing is access. People who don't have access, you know, can't use digital solutions. Uh, so access to internet, access to broadband. That that's the hard part, and very hard part, very hard to invest in as well. Um, in climate. Uh, and we haven't talked about climate a lot. I think we've, I feel we should do a climate special. I'm happy to be part of it from Hand in the Ring. Um, it, it, the main fundamental issue is people, people don't understand the long-term compounding of the bad stuff that happens when you have too much CO2 in the air. Uh, and, and there's a free rider issue as well. So people think yeah, it's going to be OK. Uh, not in my backyard type of stuff. Um, to this date, we, we, we have a ridiculous amount of coal plants running around. We have an, a, a man, tremendous methane, not even CO2, methane, 60 times as, 60 times as bad as, as uh, uh, CO2. Uh, leaks, just, just leaks, you can, you can commercially solve them. Um, so so it, it, it is very, very, very hard to solve that 
problem, uh, and, and particularly in the structure which we're solving it right now, which is f trying to get buy-in from all countries who are not at all aligned, right? H how can India, India's agenda be aligned with France's agenda? It doesn't happen. Um, so that's, that's, a, that's a problem there. And, and in, in AgTech, there's, there's a whole component of education missing as well. Uh, and and I, I think that we're, we're trying to solve that, I think, in a couple of panels before this, which is an excellent panel as well. Um, the moment education is there and people have access to better food, simply by distribution, uh, that, that, that's starting to solve stuff. Um, what, what we are trying to do uh, is combining all three. So uh, knowing, for example, that climate has very, very bad effects on, on, on yield and farming crops, we're trying to invest in vertical farming. That sort of uh, compensates for that. Um, and uh, knowing that food and nutrition is a big, uh, a, a big item, we, we, we marry sort of climate tech with ag tech, with medical tech, and, 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 and trying to solve problems that exist in all those verticals that you can only really solve when you solve all these different problems in all these different verticals together um, with the technology that we have, AI, robotics, um, machine learning. Um. Yeah, I think Eddie hit on a number of good points, and, and he and I, I'm looking forward to having a conversation uh, broadly because I think ag and health tech are just completely one in the same discussion. Um, I am fortunate enough to be an, on the advisory board of Stanford's Disruptive Technology Center, where vertical farming is a really, really important area. But the thing that makes Stanford's program kind of unique is that there's some 400 tech labs there, and the founder of this tech center, Mike Steep, who's a Microsoft guy, forces the corporate affiliates of that program to um, understand that if they're going to find a lab that can do some disruptive technological uh, advancement research of any type, that it has to be commercialized. It has to show a 10 to 1 return within 18 to, 26, or 18 to 36 months. That doesn't exist in academia, and it is probably the most important change agent that will happen, and I dare say a number of the majors, MIT and everybody else, will follow suit very quickly with that. And it's a very collaborative model, so it was just the only reason that I got involved in it is because I really believe that they want to curate things that everybody can use because they have a social impact orientation. Um, the other thing that I was going to say is that, um, and, and that's really important because then the vertical world can come directly to the south side. So you're not dealing with a distribution issue. So it's really important. And again, the diabetic world is just, you know, in the heart and the whole, all of it is nutritionally oriented. So it's really an important issue. The only thing I would say on the kind of really big risk side, which all of this is subject to, is that the more we continue to utilize technology in all of its many forms, the more it lends itself to so much data being available and cybersecurity being that much more important. And if there was any one area globally that we had to worry about, or back to Steve's point yesterday about sort of aggregating the freedom-oriented countries and the um, authoritarian countries, is that all the authoritarian countries know their biggest leverage is cyber threat. So, you know, just keep that in mind as you're thinking about everything because, again, I would kind of implore you to, to really focus on where your security elements are, and that's a budget item that probably is always under-budgeted. Yeah, Bob, that's a great, you know, in the, in, you know, that's a great finalization. You got to take off? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Appreciate well, it. Eddie, Eddie has to take off, and well, so Bob and you and I can sum it up. Um, but. And he has a flight to catch, right? Yep, he has a flight to catch. That's a great, that's a great we, we have kind of five, way to circle back um, on that, Bob, because you know part of our investment thesis, deep tech, uh, science, science tech, the deep tech part is cybersecurity, right. and we call it the currency of trust. It's the retention of the currency of trust. Three, four minutes, and we're yep, we're, we'll sum break, it up. Break um, it out. But uh, you know, so, so you know, taking off on what you finished with this whole Stanford project and about forcing commercialization. One of the things that we've been working on closely with a number of universities in the Midwest is how to unearth that innovation in the lab. And it's not an easy chore. And where we've been most successful is where we've had great institutional presidential leadership support. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about the, Bob, if you don't mind sharing your viewpoint, a little bit more on the opportunities of unearthing that. 
that are out there. Um, oh gosh, I wouldn't even know where to start. I mean, the opportunities are boundless. There, there's, <laughs> I, I mean, pick an area and there's, there's opportunity galore. I, I think that, uh, that that's the beauty of living in the age that we're at today is that um, technology as a whole, in my view, is the same as raw uranium. It can either be used to blow people up, it can be used for unbelievable good. And, and so again, it really becomes a theological issue. You know, what side of the fence are you on? And I think what's happening, when you really look at a group like this, look what Mark is trying to do, um, ultimately, at the end of the day, the, 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 and again, we seem to be in this very polarized world between freedom and authoritarianism, and, and network is everything. So there, there really isn't enough time, I think, that any of us can spend vetting the people that we choose to call partners. And so to me, opportunity is a function of whether or not you have a trusted partner group, if you have a truly trusted, collaborative, working world. And if you do, then these opportunities are going to come flying in directions that you never expected. because. That's the beauty of diversity. That's the actual real beauty of diversity, is diverse thought creates things that you couldn't think of yourself, but you bring something special to the table, and synergistically, that word actually begins to matter. So I, I don't think I'm answering your question very well, but... No, you're doing great. Yeah, it's not, I don't, I, I can't, I, I just, I don't see anything but opportunity. The question is, how do you focus your resources? How do you budget your time? How do you make sure you're dealing with the best people possible? And, and if you stick to that, I think things are going to work out pretty well. Yeah, I kind of look at it as many of the solutions to, to a lot of the problems we have in, you know, from a climate standpoint, health standpoint, and everything else are residing in labs today. Yeah. And we're just not unearthing them because of poor incentive alignment, poor incentive structures, and uh, just l leadership or sometimes ideological differences. And, you know, but, there, but a lot of the solutions to problems that we have are sitting in the labs today. It's a major challenge of unearthing that and doing so so that it's diverse because there are a lot of particularly female and minority founders that feel particularly inhibited in the academic environment is my observation. Come join our 361 firm community of investors and thought leaders. We have a lot of events created by the community as we collaborate on investments and philanthropic interests. Join us.